From fighting against acid rain in the 80s to trying to ban toxins for children's health in the 90s and founding today's Center for Social Innovation, Tanya Sermon has spent the better part of her adult life innovating for what she hopes is a better world. Let's find out more about what's prompted that life of activism. Here is Tanya Sermon, co-founder and CEO of the Center for Social Innovation. And normally I would say welcome back to TVO because you've been on this program before. Yes, I have. But you actually weren't in the studio, right? This was, We were flooded out last time you were on. That's correct. So we were in that other place. So welcome to TVO. Well, thank you. <laughs> nice thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start with this, the Center for Social Innovation. Yes. What is that? Right, so the Center for Social Innovation is a nonprofit social mission organization that provides co-working, collaborative community space, and uh, is a launch pad for people who are working to change the world. So what we do is we support through providing shared office space, um, support and a community for over 800 social mission organizations in Toronto and New York. Is that what co-working means? Everybody sort of in there together doing their own thing, but together? Well, I mean, co-working is kind of a sub-sector of like the collaborative workspace. It's those folks who really came out of the millennium uh, needing and just with their laptop. They, they could go anywhere, do anything. They could uh, work from the Starbucks or work from a, the coffee shop. And what would happen is that a lot of folks found themselves isolated in their own homes. And so this movement around co-working was really about coming out of the church basements and out of the, the attics and, and the different workspaces and really finding each other and finding the opportunity in that community uh, to become uh, better networked and better connected so that they can become more successful. Can you give us a sense of how disparate these folks are, what they do? How, yeah. I mean, I imagine they're all doing different things, right? Yeah, and I mean, co-working is a bigger movement. And what the Center for Social Innovation is focused on is those people who have a social mission as a part of their work. So we say from farming to finance, uh, we're interested in anybody who's applying their own talents and skills to make the world a better place. And, you know, the kinds of organizations that we support are groups like the Stopgap Foundation, that is building ramps to create accessibility throughout Canada or uh, the Cy uh, Cycle Toronto which is advocating for better bicycle infrastructure in the city uh, organizations that are working in international development uh, groups and so they're working in Tanzania or in other places around the world so you know what's interesting is we we really are a community of people that are working across sectors so arts environment social justice health care and we believe it's in that connection or the intersection between these different sectors that we start to see new ideas popping up, uh, new collaborations, and, and that's where we get we get super excited. And it's not enough just to create a successful small business and make a living. There's got to be some kind of social mission to this as well? You bet. You bet. So, you know, our social mission is to support, catalyze, and inspire social innovation. So what is social innovation? For me, the simple answer is it's new ideas that make the world a better place. And so we're really, really focused on supporting, supporting those people and organizations that are really applying their talents and their skills uh, to making the world better, to put people and planet first. Does every big city in the world pretty much have one of these kind of things? Uh, oh, I, I no, I don't think so. No? I, I mean, co-working is certainly, and collaborative workspace is a movement that's taken hold in the last decade. CSI was actually an early pioneer in that space. We we developed our own version of co-working when we called it virtual tenancy, and it, and it came out of a need to support volunteers who, you know, a, a small festival, a film festival, might be two people for, for 10 months of the year, but then it expands to be 25 or, or 50 with interns and volunteers, and then it, it, it goes back down. And so in our early days when we were really innovating this concept of co-working for our own purposes, it was very much about supporting the flexibility of social mission and volunteer organizations to be able to do their work. And very quickly, as the internet kind of dot-com boom and bust uh, resulted in a new form of entrepreneurship where you started to see folks who wanted to change the world who were using sort of entrepreneurial tactics and uh, be building social ventures, um, they needed more flexible space. They needed to be able to work and meet and connect and network and they needed to get access to tools and resources and so that's what we've done is we've built out uh, a physical space, so five locations, 165,000 square feet in, in two mm -hmm. cities. Um, we just bought a new building at 192 Spadina, a 64,000 square downtown foot Toronto. building, downtown Toronto. And 
What we then do is we provide other kinds of support. So we run the Ontario Catapult Microloan Fund, which is a collaboration with government, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector. We support them through matchmaking and a product and a, a, a service that we call Hookup, which connects people who have business services and skills to offer to those who are sort of up and coming and help them to find one another. Um, and the kind of work that we do in our, in our community is really very much about removing the barriers to those connections to speed up uh, the opportunity for those entrepreneurs to be able to get their products, their services to market. Now that building you just bought, yeah. that's not in a cheap part of town. No. How much was that building? Oh, uh, well, I can't exactly say how much, but I can say this. Uh, we've had to raise uh, four and a half million dollars of our own community bonds to be able to secure that, but we had the help of um, Alterna Savings and, and uh, Citizens Bank with the mortgage. And look, it was, a big, it was a big project. And what we did with that building is we leveraged the power of our community uh, by offering citizens an opportunity to invest in the, in the building. That was the sort of enabling thing that allowed us to be able to make that kind of a purchase. Mm -hmm. And for us, that decision was about keeping rents affordable in the downtown core to be able to better support those early stage social ventures that we think have world changing potential. So give it, I mean, there were some numbers that just came out today that show the average price, the average price, mm -hmm. the average price of a house in Toronto yeah. is a million dollars now. I know. And you didn't buy a house, you bought a building. <laughs> so that gives us some sense about what we're talking about here. Yeah, that's right. What kind of rent do you have to charge your people in order to be able to pay your mortgage. Yeah. You know, one of the things about CSI and what we're doing is, you know, we, we have to pay and charge market rents, kind of. But what we do is through our intense sharing, we're able to shift the whole business model of, of workspace. So, you know, when you share meeting rooms and you share kitchens and telephone booths and business services and fax machines and internet access, and you've got you know, 800 organizations that share those costs, what we found is we're able to keep the costs affordable to those uh, folks through the power of that sharing. Gotcha. Let's, uh, can we talk a bit about you? Yeah, sure. Because I met, the last time you were on this program when we were back in Leaside in those temporary uh, makeshift studios, I think you said something like it took you five years to do a three-year degree back in the day. <laughs> do I have that right? That's correct. Now, why yeah. would it take five years to do a three-year degree? Well, I'm maybe not the um, <clears throat> shining example of academia. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say you were doing other things at the same time. Well, I think I, think I saw the university as an opportunity for all of my extracurricular work. So, you know, while I was was at, um, at university, I was working full time. Uh, I had uh, was a part of an organization that was working on acid rain with the Backyard Acid Rain Kit program from decades ago. I was a part of a group called Global Development Awareness Network that was I was chairing that organization, and I was I was um, co-founding one of my first for-profit businesses. I started a little uh, business called Walk Your Talk Publications. It was a complete failure, complete <laughs> and absolute dismal failure. But it was. Um, for me, I really wasn't very good at the academic side of things. Um, I, I've been an entrepreneur in my heart and in my soul since the very beginning. And, uh, you know, for me, it was just an excuse to, to try new things. Well, there is that great expression, which is don't let the academics get in the way of your education. <laughs> that's right, right. Which you didn't that's do. Right. You no. got your education. I mean, education writ large. Well, and it was really a... Five years to get a three-year BA, which is still quite pathetic. So. Not at all. I mean, when you look at what other things you managed to do. I mean, and let's face it, you, you won the acid rain fight, right? Yeah. Well, not me, but uh, the community well, did. Everybody sure. together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was a big deal. Yeah. Do you know why, you just sort of told us jokingly, you're not exactly the world's most um, raging capitalist. Mm -hmm. Do you know why you are apparently wired to worry less about making a lot of money and more to repairing the world? You know, um... I've thought about it uh, quite a bit. I had the privilege of being raised by a hippie, uh, a complete, uh, I, and I'm not sure whether he was left wing or right wing hippie. I, I don't know which direction, but you know, my I was raised by my father back in the 70s, and um, you know, he really impressed upon me um, that success is how we define it, and that um, you know, you can't take it with you. All the money in the world and you can't take it with you. Hmm. And when you start to dig into people who have incredible amounts of wealth, they'll get to the other side of that wealth and then they'll start looking for their purpose. And I just decided to jump start that and go right to purpose. Um, for me, it's been very clear my whole life that I'm here 
to, uh, to achieve a purpose. Uh, I, I see that I can bring the skills and talents that I bring um, to, to this work. I, there's never been a question for me. Now, the question of how I do it is, is a constant struggle, but the question of will I do it has never been an issue. And I think it's simply, uh, well, why the heck not? Hmm. Uh, none of my damn business, but you put it out there. You said you were raised by your dad, yeah. and of course, uh, you know, What's the story with mom? <laughs> My mother was 17 years old when I was born. Uh, both of them come from uh, northern Ontario. And um, she found herself as a very, very young mother. And she made choices in her early life. Um, and, um, you know, the situation was the situation. So when, um, when I was four years old, I, was, I had my little sister. And, um, and they broke up. And my father was the one who stepped in to... Um, to play that role as, as the primary caregiver and um, not an easy thing to do in the 70s and um, you know I'm sure it was quite a bitter battle at that time but suffice it to say I have no regrets my father and my mother are, are incredible people but they're both in your life they're both in my life and my, my, my mother really is one of the best grandparents in the world so mm. she's you know when it comes to uh, my children I don't think I could have asked for a, a better grandmother and um, but, but being raised by a, a crazy lunatic, uh, hippie, conspiracy theory kind of phenomena. He, he, he may be watching this. You know. I know, and he knows he, it. He knows, he knows, <laughs> he knows who knows thinks this about him. Okay. And he also knows how much I absolutely adore and love him. <laughs> and uh, I'm grateful for that kind of alternative upbringing because it really took away any perceptions of what was right or what was wrong and gave me the ability to think about the world differently. Hmm. And um, I feel blessed. Do I take it you were... You got two kids. I do. Do I take it you were not 17 when you had yours? Oh no, no. I just <laughs> I decided to wait that one out a little bit longer. <laughs> I'm uh, a very proud mom of two teenage boys, uh, 13 and 15. Did you? I mean, given your obviously your own family background, did mm -hmm. you um, did you have any questions about whether you wanted to have kids at all? No, no. I've known from uh, I've never not known that I wanted children. Uh, there was no question in my, in my body, in my bones, in my brain, nothing. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a mom. Did you ever wonder about how that would uh, influence or have an impact on your ability to achieve a lot of the social missions in life you want to? You know, I think it really comes down to this question of what did I think I was going after? Um, you know, I've never aspired to be a leader. I've never aspired to be even to be an entrepreneur. I... For me, my, I'm driven by purpose. And um, I have found a way over the last 20 years of, of being able to bring, um, to bring a, an integration of my, of my personal purpose uh, mission into, um, into my family, I think with, uh, you know, lots of struggles. But um, I, I never really had a clear plan. Uh, there wasn't like I had a, uh, this is what I want to achieve and I want to be this or be that. I, I've always just wanted to have an impact. Well, you knew you wanted kids even before the husband came along. I did. So were you prepared to Murphy Brown it if you had to? <laughs> you know what? Um, I remember the negotiation with my husband when we sat in the Peter's Chung King at college and uh, Spadina in downtown Toronto and we negotiated. I said, let me be clear. I want kids. You're either in or you're out. But that's the deal, buddy. And, um, you know, he certainly... Uh, I don't know what he actually thought before that, but he was ready to make the commitment then. So. Did you agree on number at that time? You know, I don't know that we had any. Yeah, I think we did actually probably. Yep. <laughs> I mean, yeah. We're going to have two. We'll sign, two. Sign right here on the Ironically, line. Ironically, I think they were going to be daughters in my mind. So the uh, fact that I got sons was a, a delight, but a, a little unexpected. And when they were just little wee ones, yeah. how did you, like, how'd you figure all that out? You know, it, it's an interesting thing. And, um, I'll say that uh, I always knew that I wanted children. I always knew that that was my choice and that I would do whatever it took uh, to be the best mom that I could. And I also knew that I was not interested in compromising my own sense of self in that purpose. Um, you know, it was a juggling act. Uh, we started a cooperative daycare, a whole bunch of my uh, other parents, to be able to care for the kids in their early years. Um, we, you know, we juggled with daycare and, and purpose. You know, and one of the sacrifices that, um, that I made in those early days was really about the strategic direction of the Centre for Social Innovation. Um, I've been doing this work at CSI for 11 years now. That would make my, my youngest son two when I started this work. Hmm. Um, and there's no question... Uh, in retrospect, looking at the choices that I've made professionally, 
they have absolutely been informed by my, um, my commitment to my kids. I mean, one of the questions is, would we have scaled globally? Why did we go so deep in Toronto? Well, one of the realities is I had to be there by 5.45 to pick up the kids for daycare every single day. And so, um, you know, I think we made strategic choices to become a, a, a very Toronto-centric initiative until very recently. And, you know, the, the move to open up a location in New York City was very much paralleled by my ability, given the age of the kids, to be able to... Um, to be able to travel a little bit more and to support both those cities. Do you think it's, and I don't want to give the impression that it was easy, but do you think it was easier given that you work in one of these, you don't work in a button down world, right? You don't work in one of these, like a lot of rules and strict and conventions and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it presumably would have been a lot harder to do what you did if you were trying to do it with young children in that world, yes? I don't know. I mean, I don't know because I've never uh, been willing to work in those environments. Right. Um, but I will say the pressure of leadership in the nonprofit sector, I think, is maybe even more intense than the for-profit sector in many ways because we balance multiple bottom lines. Hmm. It's not just a, a, a profit bottom line. It's also a, a, a mission bottom line. Hmm. And, you know, we don't have... Um, uh, the profit is still the profit. It's just like any other business. And I personally have had my house on the line in order to ensure the success of CSI in the past. And, and so have several of our board members. And you know we have done for this organization what any entrepreneur would do in any for-profit. Uh, the sacrifices have been tremendous. Um, and the risks that we've taken have been commensurate. Um, I, I think that nonprofits are harder. Uh, more challenging because we not only have to balance the bottom line, but we also have to do it by living our values, and mm -hmm. that is no easy challenge. You've talked a, a bit about leadership here, and you mm -hmm. claim you never intended to be a big shot leader on the world stage. Oh, God. <laughs> but having said that, you, you are one, whether you like it or not. I mean, you are leading a movement here. Mm -hmm. What do you think makes for a good leader? Hmm. Um, great, great question. Um, authenticity. You know, uh, a real leader to me is one who um, can be bold and creative, who can hold and embrace and synthesize other perspectives, and who's willing to be honest and authentic um, about the work that they're doing, about the challenges, about the compromises, about the balancing act. Um, no, I never intended to be a leader. That was never my goal. But I think what has defined uh, me is my passion for purpose, my passion to make a change in the world, has required that I'm willing to carry a lot and to hold that um, weight and be willing to believe um, that we can do it and manage that uh, when we build an incredible team to make those things happen. Young people who are graduating, many of whom do not know what their purpose is right now. Yeah. They know they've got this piece of paper, and for a lot of them, they don't know what they want to do with it. Mm -hmm. Can you give them some advice on, on how to find your purpose if you don't yet have it, even <laughs> after whatever, four, five, six years of education? Yeah, I, I, I get asked that a lot, and I think everybody's path is going to be different, and it's no easy challenge. But, you know, I, I, um, I really believe that our rage is a, a really good clue onto what it is that is our purpose. So, so what, what infuriates what you? What infuriates you? Huh. What drives you mental? What just, ugh, you know, like what gets you really worked up? And, and, and or what do you feel passionate about? Um, you know, what is it? For, for me, a lot of my work was actually fueled by inefficiency. It drove me mental to see nonprofit social mission organizations that are all reinventing the wheel. It was like, oh, it just drove me mental. And so that, really inspired a lot of my work around collaboration and around community and how we work together. Like, how do we get folks from a different perspectives to actually understand what we agree on? Mm -hmm. So everybody's purpose is going to be different and they're all gonna approach it in different ways, but I think what, what's really important to this path for, for so many young people is just to remember that the truth is in your heart and it's going to be a combination of what you what you feel, what you experience, and also the skills and talents that you have to bring to bear. And it's a, it's a great game of Tetris to put it all together, <laughs> but it's, a, it's an incredible journey. And remember, I always say, um, my, my life mission is to make social change and have fun doing it. And if you're not having fun, you gotta really question what you're doing. And money is not the only objective. Uh, finding the way that we can be whole and be kind and embrace uh, the joys of, of um, 
the incredible people around us, th those are the values that I think are going to be most important to helping us understand how to find our life purpose. Just finally, do you know what your next mission is? <laughs> um, I have some ideas, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I'm, I'm ecstatic about what we've been able to build at CSI, and I think we're just beginning. When you start to look at 800 incredible organizations that are doing work in all of these different worlds, we know that we are a part of a movement. Um, the movement to put people on planet first is real. It's in every corporation. We're seeing it in institutions, in government, in small businesses, in medium-sized businesses. People want to be a part of the solution. And you know what? We all have a role to be... Um, we all have a role in making that happen. And so for me, I hope to have uh, the next 10 years be really focused on helping us um, move that and enable that movement to really, uh, to really thrive. Anybody ever tell you to come up with a different acronym? <laughs> you won't forget it. <laughs> well, that is true. That is true. Tanya Sermon is the founding CEO of the Center for Social Innovation, CSI. Good to see you here at TVO again. Wonderful to be here, Steve. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.